in those ancient days when the good destinies had been decreed, and after An and Enlil had set up the divine rules of heaven and earth, then the Lord of Broad Wisdom, Inki, the master of destinies, founded dwelling places. He took in his hand waters to encourage and create good seed. He laid out side by side the Tigris and the Euphrates, and caused them to bring water from the mountains. He scoured out the smaller streams and positioned the other water courses. Inki made spacious sheepfolds and cattle pens and provided shepherds and herdsmen. He founded cities and settlements throughout the earth and made the black-headed multiply. He provided them with a king as shepherds, elevating him to sovereignty over them. The king rose as the daylight over the foreign countries. The debate between bird and fish. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me, and uh, if this is your first episode, welcome. Uh, we had a surprisingly number or high number of downloads uh, last week, and I think there are some new people in those, and I hope you all will continue to listen and enjoy. And my returning listeners, I, I hope the same for you as well. Uh, so today, my goal is to finish up our urbanization specials for this season, and uh, what I think this will probably be the last kind of, excuse me, um, bridge episode, I guess for lack of a better term, for uh, a little while, for this, uh, probably for this season, we might do like a general thing as well a little bit later, but... Uh, my goal right now is for this to be the final uh, episode, and then we'll continue on uh, back to our more normal format, uh, where we go region by region, people by people, and then, uh, of course, continue on for this season's time frame. Um, before that, though, I did have a point I should have made last week, both for clarity and because it plays into our discussions uh, this week and uh, will be, you know, kind of a point going into what is now the historical, uh, the historical period, or what will be becoming the historical period, and that is um, just as a reference, uh, Plato and Aristotle's understanding of urban and city formation. Uh, they were working much like Child after them with what they had at the time, which were uh, historical records, folk history, personal experiences and expertise, and of course uh, the myths that the Greeks were familiar with, or uh, I guess the religious teachings uh, for the, uh, with what they were work, uh, that they had as a frame of reference. Uh, now we've talked about the historiosity of, um, you know, uh, folk record, personal experience, and uh, things like that, and, and myths when we talked about the original peoples, uh, or excuse me, the aboriginal peoples of Australia. And the same thing applies to uh, other peoples as to the aborigines. Uh, so while Plato and Aristotle may not have accepted all their religious myths as 100% actual factual historic events, they probably accepted them at least partly at, at least as partly true and, and valued at least you know the big ones um, because they understood them as having value because people believed them and accepted them and whether they believed a mythological event were true partly true or completely made up they understood that those stories were important building blocks of their society and civilization uh, hence they based their philosophy and understandings uh, on these assumptions and knowledge. And earlier historians, philosophers, and people do the same thing all over the world. And, you know, latter ones will as well, uh, yours truly included. So while they might be wrong with some of their facts about the origins of cities, they were not broadly incorrect. In fact, their beliefs about the cities in Greece proper being the conglomerate uh, of smaller towns and villages, uh, that is broadly correct, uh, at least from what we can see in the archaeological record. Uh, but we'll talk more about those cities later, though. 
Uh, for now, we should talk about the cities that emerge at the earliest points of this season. And uh, for those earliest parts of this season, which 6,000, 5,000 BC, uh, we will see two primary locations where cities are being uh, founded or see that final conglomeration of towns and villages into a single um, unit, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, and then, uh, of course, going forward, we'll hit that point definitely by the start of the following millennium, so 5,000 to 4,000, uh, we'll, where you'll see a number of neighboring cities come about. Uh, and these sites were in southern Mesopotamia and in the Indus River Valley. Now, of course, there are other future sites and regions where settlement begins around this time, but these locations take a little longer to reach what we would today consider a city. Uh, some of them will be talked about in this episode and season, but others won't be talked about until later. It depends on if they're super important or if they just have interesting facts about them. I'll, I'll kind of include them as, as needed. Now, uh, in Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and the Mediterranean coast, uh, or I should say the Mediterranean uh, eastern coast in the modern Levant region, uh, a lot of the early semi-permanent settlements and agricultural sites were in ectones, usually in the foothills, near small rivers or streams, or in areas where rainfall was plentiful. However, these sites were not able to fully support uh, the rapidly expanding populations. Uh, and this was due to a number of issues, uh, including climate change, which led to a drier uh, less rain-prone climate for more of the year as opposed to, you know, wetter uh, periods. Uh, there are, of course, lack of other resources. Um, the land's carrying capacity gets reached, etc. And in some cases, it was a combination of, you know, all those factors and maybe a couple of others. Uh, but those are the primary ones uh, in the, again, in the Mesopotamian, Anatolian, uh, Levant region. Now, some groups would split from these sites and travel to areas with, you know, similar geography and climates, uh, and they found other smaller sites and start this process all over again. However, other groups begin to migrate to and establish villages closer to uh, the plains and marshes and much closer to larger, more powerful bodies of water. Um, or maybe I should say that um, there may be undiscovered sites that are contemporary with these hilly and mountainous settlements um, that have been buried under the earth by, you know, the shifting of rivers and things like that. Um, so they may be contemporaneous with earlier sites like uh, uh Chattahuyuk, Gobekli Tepe, but we, if they existed, we haven't found evidence of them. Um, whatever the exact case is, with access to the rivers and marshes for irrigation, and you know the alluvial soil being transported from the highlands and mountains by these larger rivers, uh, these lowland villages were able to not just keep their population stable but to grow exponentially faster than what had been seen before. Um, and they were able to do this, but they were also still able to save portions of their harvest for use in winter and in times of crisis. They were able to do this without having to send sizable portions of their populations away to found new settlements. Um, they would still do that, of course, um, to establish, you know, access or control of other resources that they didn't have, but they didn't have to do this. They did this as something of a, maybe of a convenience. Um, now, these sites also saw something happening we don't really see all that much in hunter-gatherer societies or in small villages. 
Uh, and this is social separation and stratification. Now, in sites without writing or engravings or very abstract art, this is um, this is judged based on comparing um, how contemporary people were buried, um, what condition they were in when they died, where and what they're buried with. Um, typically in stratified societies, more important people were buried with more grave goods or other things that make them stand out. Um, it also could be the case that, um, or it might not be a case of class. You might see people that may have had different careers or trades buried in, dis in distinct ways from each other. Each may have been interred you know, in a manner considered completely respectable and dignified for them. Uh, so, you know, a farmer might not be buried with weapons. He might be buried with um, just his hand axe or, you know, he might, you know, have been buried close to uh, land that he worked, that kind of thing. Whereas a warrior, you might say, or a hunter, you might see him buried with uh, more items because he used those items uh, more frequently than a, a, a farmer would have. Uh, the next factor you see that separates these sites from smaller towns and villages is the, I guess, the issues of organization. Um, due to the large and still growing population, um, organization was needed to make sure that, you know, things like uh, the cycles of plowing, planting, maintaining, and harvesting were being performed as efficiently and productively as possible. Uh, you also have to mention that um, several other tasks, including um, helping settling disputes between various neighboring communities and individuals was done. You have to keep track of surplus and making sure that you know enough food is being saved for uh, winter and the future. Uh, you also have to make sure that those surpluses are protected. Um, so you would choose uh, so I ask, who would you choose for these very important and uh, significant tasks? Well, the first Mesopotamian people to found cities, uh, the Sumerians, and then later their neighbors chose gods for this task. Now, a god's house and the term the Sumerians used was a, or e, was possibly um, or I should say it was possibly pronounced as hush at first, uh, and then it got shortened over time. Um, this, this word was the same word that they used for their homes. Uh, God's house was a, just as a human's house was. Uh, these God's houses were constructed as important meeting and gathering places for the nearby villages and towns and um, the city's infrastructure, uh, at least in their earliest periods, spread from these focal points and connected the new city's various neighborhoods with it. And, of course, with their you know, various territories and farmlands and things like that. Um, and, it, you know, as time goes on, each um, grew closer and closer together. Now, as time progressed uh, and the city got larger, the god's house was expanded or moved to another part of the city that was maybe more conducive to uh, overseeing things. And once this happens, the temples would in general be called Egal, or Big House, though later all temples would have had a specific proper name. Um, the first Sumerian city, or at least the oldest one we know, and the oldest one mentioned in Sumerian records and copies of Sumerian records, was Eridu, or as the Sumerians may have said, Eriduk. And its primary god, and the first with a home in the city, was Enki. Uh, and as an example of proper names of temples, his temple in Eridu was referred to as either the Eabzu or as um, Eingura, depending on you know the time frame you're talking about 
it may have gone by different names. Now, Iridu uh, was expressed in cuneiform with two symbols, uh, nun and ki, which together meant, they were written together and that, that meant it was referring to that city. Now, um, Sumerian, their writing system is logographic, so this might confuse some listeners as the Latin alphabet is not logographic, but if you're familiar with East Asian writings or writing systems, you'll probably understand or at least have a better time understanding um, what I'm, I'm trying to convey. Uh, I think, um, as an example, uh, Japanese, I think kanji is their logographic writing system. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's kanji. I think kana is the other one, but um, regardless, all symbols in cuneiform Every symbol represent whole words. The symbol nun meant first, best, or foremost. And ki meant land, place, earth, etc. So these two symbols written together meant eridu, even though neither word is close to how eridu or eridug uh, was pronounced. And we'll talk more about this when we get to our episodes on the Sumerians. Uh, of course, writing is still in the future. Uh, it's after this season, I think, uh, for sure. Um, Inki's name probably means Lord of Earth. Uh, in was a title used by historical individuals, not just gods, and it, it has been translated the way... Uh, uh, in has been translated, excuse me, as uh, Lord by speakers of several different languages. And um, as we mentioned before, the cuneiform word ki is earth or land, hence Lord of the Earth. Um, I would like to talk more about Enki and the Sumerian religion, but I need to make sure that I um, kind of save that for later. Uh, I, I do want, again want to talk about that kind of stuff when we talk about the Sumerians more specifically. But I just wanted to bring it up just kind of in general now, so you have a little bit better idea of um, how the cities were organized, at least in Sumeria. Um, now, we don't really know at the earliest periods um, how the cities were governed. Uh, of course, at later times, we understand that uh, priests uh, or in uh, inns as they were called lords, uh, they were very important and they would be in charge of the cities themselves, though uh, we don't know, uh, at least initially it doesn't appear as this is a hereditary role, um, but it's likely that these priests were not the sole authority. They probably um, definitely had a very important uh, religious function, but religious in a city where you're ruled by a god, um, you know, religious functions and political functions and governing functions are all kind of tied in together. So uh, most likely the priests were very influential, uh, but whether or not they directly controlled day-to-day -day operations or if they were kind of a first among equals of a number of different roles, maybe chosen by, you know, uh, different groups or different neighborhoods or from people performing the tasks that they're overseeing and then of course the priests you know, have to give their blessing or that kind of thing we're not really sure uh, but once you get into the historical period uh, it's definitely a case of um, uh, seeing that the ends had basically become kind of the supreme authority and this will eventually change eventually you'll get um, different titles uh, for kings like true as we would think about them, kings. And the kings kind of take over um, a lot of the religious functions, though even at that period, the priests do do a lot of the daily uh, functions of religion, and the priests, or the kings kind of oversee. Eventually, like, the priests become the very top, or excuse me, the kings become the very top of the pyramid um, of like, or at the very top of a government, and they kind of take on all the roles of the people under them. Uh, though, again, depending on the city and at the time, 
this could be more direct than at other periods uh, where it may be more ceremonial. Uh, but that's all stuff we'll talk about later. Um, now, when we say that the gods had a house, uh, that was uh, literally and figuratively, um, there would always be a statue or representation of a god in their temple. Uh, it was treated as the god on earth. Uh, they would make offerings to the idols. Uh, they would uh, make sure that the gods had food available, that they were uh, covered or that they had you know clothing. Um, at some points you'll see um, you know, that they would have had uh, makeup or things that would have, um, you know, been something that, you know, any person of any kind of high status would have. And generally, the god statue would have the best. Um, and that's kind of, um, that's kind of all throughout uh, Mesopotamian society. Uh, and this is something you see in other places, too. Um, now, I should point out that the Sumerians of Eridu, um, we don't know the exact relation between all the Sumerian cities, at least at the earliest period. Um, were all these people, um, you know, colonies sent out from Eridu and they would eventually found all these other cities? Or were these other Sumerian peoples, um, you know, cousins to the Eridu or Eridugs? Uh, and you know, they began founding their own cities with their local gods, um, and they just kind of copied the idea from Eridu. They felt this was a good way to organize. We're really, really not sure. Um, but uh, with these kind of uh, houses of the gods, these temples as their focus, um, a lot of these cities, you know, they begin to formalize and and uh, stratify in a way, much like their societies, they begin to stratify their their territories. Um, we'll talk about it more in the future, but um, that's you know they they make firm claims on what land belongs to their city, to their god, uh, to do with as that god pleases. Uh, and again, this is something that becomes a major issue in a number of these city-states uh, going forward in, again, next season. Uh, although, obviously, there are instances taking place in this season that we maybe just don't have records about. Um, other, of course, parts of the city, you'll see uh, irrigation starting to be dug to make sure that your crops and your fields have enough water. Uh, there is always kind of a kind of a playoff between, you know, making sure your city has enough farmland, but also keeping enough um, uh, land that's available for grazing for sheep, goats, uh, things like that. Um, most cities, uh, in fact, all of them, as far as I know, at least for the Sumerians, uh, they all prioritize farmland over uh, grazing land. And that's Probably not just a Sumerian thing. I think that's pretty much all of the Mesopotamian peoples, and in general, all cities really. Um, you know, meat's a very uh, nice uh, dish, but it's not something that everyone has access to. It's usually fairly expensive, uh, unless you know your city is just doing very, very well and can choose to import uh, or supplement. You know, get other um, sources of it, and of course. You're not getting rid of your hunters and gatherers. They're just living in the cities now. They're they're more stable, and you know you do have people that are going out and fishing and you know harvesting uh, wild sources of food as well. Uh, you'll also begin to see people getting uh, metals, copper, uh, and later uh, copper, tin, everything you need to make bronze, uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, and again, uh, the Sumerians, of course, have their own kind of region uh, at the very southern part of um, the Mesopotamia where the Tigris and Euphrates enter the Persian Gulf. Um, 
and that is again it's still further inland than it is today eridu now is like in the middle of a very dry deserty part of um, iraq but in the past it was very close to the ocean it was only a few uh, a few miles from the ocean i believe it might have been even closer um, but there are other people's neighbors to the sumerians that are seeing a rise in villages and um, towns and things like that and eventually these people are going to form their own cities we'll talk about them later but neighbors to the sumerians do have their own uh, proto uh, urbanizing movements happening but it appears that they do kind of um base uh, their organizations on the Sumerians, probably because they saw how successful the Sumerians were. And uh, each city uh, of the Sumerians will have their own god that the city is dedicated to. Um, there are, uh, in some cases, eventually cities will have multiple gods residing in them, or at least multiple houses. The god may or may not be there, depending on war or things like that um, but we'll again dive into all this later so in addition to these temple complexes uh, you also have uh, roads begin to be uh, worked on or at least um, they're not paved necessarily but they are you know they're they're very clearly distinctly uh, made for easy travel because there's no horses uh, or anything like that at this period um, you also see, of course, bigger and bigger city walls become important. Uh, and this is not just a factor of keeping people out. This is not just a matter of keeping your neighbors out of your city. It's also a matter of keeping your people in. Um, there's always, always a need for uh, workforce in these type of cities, especially when the temples um, need to produce these big works. You may not have enough labor um, on hand if you also have to make sure that you're maintaining your fields and your, your herds. So uh, you'll see slavery become much more prevalent. Um, and if, you know, if the conditions are especially harsh, people do try to leave these cities and go live out in the countryside. And there's always a, a hard time of making sure these urban centers have enough labor. Uh, so they're supplemented not just with other Sumerians, uh, but also slaves, who, who could be other Sumerians, but they were also from neighboring peoples. Uh, sometimes these were people bought and sold like that. Sometimes these are people captured in battle. Um, all that is part and parcel of uh, these very early civilizations and speaking of uh, battle and uh, defending your territory um, armies uh, become a thing um, now these are not very large at the earliest periods um, they probably didn't have you know too much in terms of resources um, to support large armies nothing would be it's not nothing like a standing army there might be like a few like full-time warriors, professional fighters, uh, or men who are just very physically gifted. Um, but for the large part, you're probably looking at seasonal work uh, or like a seasonal call-up if necessary. Um, these armies would not be very uh, well-armed. They'd probably just have um, you know, whatever clothes they would have on their back. They'd have you know, probably good shoes if possible. Um, the weapons they would have would be very simple, uh, wooden spears, stone tips, uh, arrows, uh, bows, uh, clubs. Clubs are really big as, at this earlier period. Um, the, the symbol of kingly authority, the mace, is just a fancy club with a metal head. Those don't exist yet, so they just probably have large, uh, hard, wooden clubs or maybe a club that has had a, um, a stone affixed to it like a heavy weighted stone um, no swords uh, 
make probably some daggers though you probably wouldn't i would imagine you wouldn't fight with those earlier daggers uh very much um you'd probably just use that for like um you know cutting and tying and things like that but um probably in a you know you know you know you know worst case scenario uh a knife might be better than nothing uh, unfortunately we don't know how these were organized uh if it was like a maybe a neighborhood system or a tribal system it's just really hard to say we, we don't know <clears throat> now um moving out of mesopotamia uh let's move a little bit further to the east and talk about um what will become the indus valley civilization uh specifically the site of marigar um now we talked about marigar a lot uh last season uh it is still uh existing at our our time frame uh and around 5000 bc maybe a little bit before maybe a little bit after uh marigar probably hits that point where it's a city uh, it, it hits that urbanization point where the population is concentrated. Um, now, sadly, we don't know much about Marigar in terms of how it was organized. Uh, and we can't really make any guesses on later periods because um, we don't know or we haven't been able to decipher the writing of the Indus Valley Civilization. Uh, a lot of what we know about these earlier Sumerian periods we've been able to kind of put together based on the structure of the the next couple of millennia after this happened because we have writings we know what they say uh, how, or you know we know the stories of how these things are said to have evolved we do not have that for Marigar and Marigar does and all uh, in this valley civilizations do not appear to have these large, temple complexes there's no sign of being organized around like the worship of a specific uh, god or its idol uh, it's very possible that was done but we don't have any proof of that uh, we don't have any record of that um, but um, of course later there are big centralized buildings in the Indus Valley cities but their purpose is not known unfortunately and in some cases they appear to be very large very fancy uh baths so there there could have been an, uh, an element of like ritual cleanness um but we just don't have too much in the way of um specifics unfortunately and uh it's really it's really a mystery uh we we don't know again how Marigar was related to the Indus Valley civilization. They definitely had contacts with each other, but again, we don't have writing. We don't know if they saw themselves as uh, being the same people. Um, we don't know if the Indus Valley civilization was maybe founded by neighbors of Marigar. Um, later Indus Valley civilization sites, they do have a lot of uniformity in terms of like. Uh, their building material, their building sizes, their dimensions. Uh, Marigard doesn't really have that because it is so much older. And it is a it is abandoned, um, at least largely abandoned, by the time the Indus civilization is in kind of its middle stages. Uh, so Marigard may not have been in the best of shape. It, it could have been abandoned naturally. It could have been... Um, maybe just kind of outcompeted by the much more organized in this valley peoples um it's just it's really really hard to say uh, but it does show that the indus civilizations uh are working kind of on a different uh organization at least as far as we can tell that's kind of the interpretation uh it's organized differently than what you'll see in mesopotamia uh, it's really a fascinating subject, and um, I really like learning more about that. Of course, there's a lot of problems. You get a lot of um, fringe and pseudo-archaeologists uh, and, like, um, 
ultra nationalist Hindu groups in uh, India making all these really wild claims about um, the Indus Valley civilization, uh, like they invented nukes and things like that, and that the their religious texts are describing like nuclear wars and stuff. Um, but that's all extremely fringe. It's just like one of those ancient alien stuff um, kind of deals. Like um, another thing that we'll talk about when we probably talk about uh, Sumerian civilizations. There are people who think like the um, the Mesopotamian gods are like really aliens, like the Anunnaki are like really aliens and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we'll go into that when we talk about Sumerian religion. Uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, uh, kind of make it hard sometimes to dive into like the real, the really interesting parts of history as opposed to the more uh, fantastical parts. Um, now, in terms of the other big ancient civilizations of, uh, or at least in the old world, uh, Egypt, China, and places like that, um, their cities do not form really until after uh, this season. Uh, probably, uh, yeah. Now, they are becoming more and more sedentary, but they don't really hit that catalyst and you know, form these uh, large... Uh, really dense uh, civilizations until a little bit after the season, at least as far as I can, uh, as I'm aware. Um, in fact, a lot of the permanent settlements that we see in Ch in China or what is now China, um, they aren't occupied at this point. They are occupying places, but those places don't grow into these big cities. Uh, that's something that happens, I think, at the start of next season. Um, so they're kind of in the phase where it's like Chattahoyuk and Gobekli Tepe. They're, they're getting close to it, but for whatever reason, these sites that they're living in now just aren't quite conducive to forming these large urban settlements. Uh, now for Egypt, a uh, little bit different so, uh, situation. Where we are now in terms of human technology and Egypt's environment, which while certainly much greener at this season than it is in today's world, still it's not the most conducive to forming large settlements, at least outside of the Nile. Um, there are probably all up and down the Nile, there are probably tons and tons of little villages and uh, small towns you know, just dotting the Nile at this period. Um, but you don't really see cities come about until um, you get to, the, like, the pre-dynastic period. And even then, at the end of that period, uh, there's just not enough... Um, there's just not much of a, an ability yet for humans to form larger settlements there. Uh, now, eventually, they'll get better irrigation techniques uh, and things like that that will allow some larger cities or some towns to form into cities. Um, but from my understanding is uh, none of the major cities in Egypt, um, even when Egypt is at its greatest and most powerful, uh, they're kind of limited on how big they can actually get. But they do end up having a lot of these little cities kind of dotting going up and down the Nile. Uh, so Egypt, uh, despite their cosmopolitan areas being very rich, wealthy, well-organized, um, they may not have the largest cities because there just isn't a way to support them. Um, but that's stuff we'll talk about later. Um, there are very old cities that are, even today, continuously inhabited, but those don't show up until... Um, at least as far as we can tell, those aren't inhabited until around um, uh, around 3,000-ish. So they'll show up next season. Um, now, there are a couple of sites in Europe uh, that have been continuously inhabited um, from this season, from the 6,000 to 4,000 range. However... Uh, these sites will not become true cities until later. Um, they, they won't reach that uh, probably 
if not next season, then the following season. Um, but these sites are all very close to Anatolia. Uh, they're probably being founded by uh, a mix of, uh, you know, Anatolian farmers migrating, uh, trying to find better better weather and land from like the dry climate in uh, Anatolia. Uh, they're getting to uh, Greece and uh, Bulgaria, um, Athens. People start living where where Athens is sometime between five and four thousand BC. Uh, Thebes, ancient Thebes, um, it's being occupied uh, around 5,000. Um, there's another site, I forget, I forget the name. It's not like one of the major ones. Um, but you also have, um, in the Peloponnese, you have Argos, uh, which is going to be like one of the first major mainland Greek cities that kind of uh, has like a real presence on the world or uh, you know in the political stage um that's being people are starting to move there around 5000 bc and living there and again these are very small at this point they don't become cities until you know uh uh probably mid bronze age if that like some of them don't even become major settlements until uh the very very end of the bronze age the very start of the iron age um, but that's all for future stuff. So, um, right now, in terms of true, what I think most people today would consider urban environments, you've got two places to look at, uh, Sumeria, uh, which again is, uh, southern Mesopotamia, modern day South Iraq, and, uh, what is now, uh, modern Pakistan, uh, parts of, probably parts of India too, maybe, um. But uh, that's uh, all stuff we're going to, of course, dive into um, much more detail uh, going forward. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of uh, the highs I wanted to hit for this week. I'm trying to think if I left anything out in terms of other parts of infrastructure. Um, oh, uh, of course, uh, trash piles, um, middens. Um, very important for archaeologists. Um, they love it when they can find uh, old used up trash piles. Um, they're very good sources of information. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Armies, roads, uh, complexes. Yeah, no, I, I think that's kind of the high points. Um, of course, this should all, again, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because there are areas that may be under, you know, just tons and tons of dried out alluvium or um, uh, mud because of shifting rivers over time, all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is what we have found so far. So like Aristotle, like Plato, like uh, V. Gordon Child, we're kind of working with what we have. So uh, if any future generations are listening to this, just be aware that this is what I have access to. This is what I can kind of get a hold of. Uh, and that goes for you, my listeners, as well. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think this is a good place to kind of stop it. We're uh, we're getting close to the forty five minute mark here. Um, if you have any questions or feedback or anything along those lines, please let me know. Uh, you can reach me via email at waradrevpod at gmail .com. You can direct message me on Twitter. You can contact me uh, via YouTube. Uh, you can comment on any of the videos. I will get them eventually, uh, even if I don't read them same day. I'd like to respond. I had a very nice uh, comment a uh, little bit earlier this week. Um, someone had asked me about the name of the podcast because it is a little long and unwieldy, and I kind of explained it there. Um, but yeah, you can comment on any of his YouTube videos. I stream very regularly on YouTube. I, I try to do some historical games and stuff. Um, and that's usually a lot of fun. We're seeing a lot more subscribers on YouTube. Uh, I think the last, uh, the last couple of days I've picked up 
the around 15 16 new subscribers so um, I appreciate you all there as well um, and I appreciate you guys listening once again so uh, I hope you have enjoyed this episode I hope you will continue to listen and enjoy uh, and if you uh, again any feedback just let me know I'm always looking for constructive criticism feedback anything like that um, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you're excited to get into the actual progress on the timeline again. I know I am. Uh, we'll be back in Africa, of course. We'll start with um, kind of the sub-Saharan African regions, South Africa, East Africa, uh, and then we're going to move towards um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa in the East, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So I uh, hope you all are looking forward to that. I certainly know I am. But uh, thank you all again. I hope you have a good rest of your day, a good rest of your week, and all that stuff. I'll see you all next time. Peace.